All right, I think we can um, we can get going. Uh, thank you all for uh, turning out on such a late uh, a late date, and thank you particularly to Tatiana for uh, for rescheduling this talk um, and and for coming. We're really delighted to have you. So uh, Tatiana is uh, currently a research associate at Edinburgh, working with Ulrika Rope on her sort of concatenation of projects regarding slavery and slave children. Um, and um, and Tatiana originally trained in Haraga in archaeology, but has uh, did her PhD with Ulrika at Edinburgh on uh, freed women. And it's from that research which is now being revised towards a book that this particular uh, talk is based. So with, with no further ado, I will hand over to you. And of course, there'll be an opportunity for questions, formal questions after the talk, and then informal questions with a drink after that. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank Professor Cooper and Professor Halston for inviting me here. And uh, thanks to all of you uh, for being here. It's almost Christmas. <laughs> you probably have better things to do. Um, anyway, um, today I'm going to talk about uh, um, freed women. So I'm going to talk about uh, ordinary uh, Roman persons. But I have to say that they are ordinary because they, we're, I'm not going to talk about Livia or Nestalina today, rather I'm going to talk about more normal women. Uh, but these persons were uh, ordinary as well as extraordinary because um, these persons actually carried uh, uh, during their lives uh, a double flow. Uh, one is represented by gender, the fact that they were uh, women, and uh, the other one is the fact that they were uh, ex-slaves. So they experienced slavery, uh, enslavement at some point of, uh, of their lives. Um, today I'm going to talk about a specific topic, which is uh, the identity of uh, their husbands slash partners. And uh, um, is this true that I'm going to talk about women? Okay, the, the, actually the seminar series is on women, but uh, and actually today I'm going to talk about men, but actually the identity of their partners um, throws light on the, uh, on the women themselves. Uh, this topic is part of, comes from actually my doctoral uh, project, um, and uh, which was specifically on uh, free women, and uh, I investigated their lives uh, um, by looking at the epigraphic evidence they left behind. Um, I chose to use epigraphic evidence because uh, when we are dealing with uh, ordinary Romans, we have a more reliable and straightforward uh, uh, experience because uh, the the texts that we that we read that we analyze uh, uh, from the monuments were written by the very person, so the deceased and their families. We have, of course, to consider that what they wrote um, may not uh, you know, reflect uh, the truth, uh, but at least we know what um, the other people want, how the other people wanted them to be seen. So their voices, their choice, you know, is what, how they portray uh, themselves. Uh, in my research, I managed to collect almost 10,000 inscriptions uh, from um, all the empire. Um, half of it come from, from Rome, from the city of Rome. Uh, 3,000 come from the rest of, uh, of Italy, and less than 1,000 come from the provinces. And uh, for the provinces, I mean almost like the, all the Western provinces. The Eastern provinces, of course, were very uh, poor on, uh, on Latin inscriptions. Um, so, um, today I'm going to talk about, as I said, about the, uh, the identity of the women, free women's partners. And for identity, uh, I'm not saying that I'm going to make a list of all the people, what they did and who they were. Rather, I'm going to look at two aspects of uh, their personas, which is the legal um, status. So either they were freeborn, free men, slaves. Uh, and uh, uh, the premarital bond. So the, the bond that uh, pre-existed uh, to the marriage or the personal relationship between the free woman and uh, her, um, and their partner. And uh, in this sense, I think we can split the unions into types, endogamic unions and exogamic unions. And um, 
uh, this, uh, this, this um, difference is made considering uh, the familia. So an endogamic union to me, so how I use this term today, is uh, um, a marriage between a fit woman and a person coming from her own familia. Could be the patron, could be a fellow <coughs> fitman, um, a fellow slave, or another member of the familia, like the patron's son, for example. Uh, while for exogamy, I mean a relationship between a fit woman and a man who does not belong to her familia. Uh, and uh, the, actually, the, uh, the element I used to, to investigate this is, uh, if I don't have you know, more information um, on that, is the, um, if the, the two individuals actually the, um, share the same norman or not. Okay. Um, specifically, one of the things I want to look at today is uh, the role of Manumissio Matrimonio Causa. Um, so, the uh, manumission for the sake of marriage, I, mean, I don't think that this translation is the perfect one, um, but I think you know it well. And um, of course, you know that manumission was very important for um, slaves, not just because it allowed uh, uh, people, so ex slaves, to have a legally valid marriage, also because uh, uh, these uh, granted families to be uh, together. Of course, slaves, even if they have what we call natural families, they were not uh, legally, legally acknowledged, and the master could actually split them any time uh, and he wanted. Of course, manumission um, and freedom um, took this, uh, this risk uh, away. Manumission of the Manic House was, uh, uh, of course, it's considered a very important uh, uh, tool that uh, female slaves had in order to obtain um, freedom. Uh, indeed, it was, you know, of course, a woman could actually use uh, her seductive skills, her beauty, and her personal skills to uh, reach the master's heart and become, you know, turn from, from a slave to a matter of familias. But uh, uh, it was just one of the tools. And uh, um, it was probably, actually, we will see, according to the bibliographic evidence, it was not as common as we may uh, think. We know that actually Augustus promoted and encouraged unions between uh, freeborn men and uh, uh, free women, and consequently between uh, freeborn patrons and their free women. We also know that uh, according to um, tradition, so to, to um, legal sources, uh, legal, uh, sorry, legal source, uh, literary sources, uh, a union between a freeborn man and uh, uh, a liberta sua was absolutely fine, under uh, reason of shame. While um, a matrimonium justum between um, an indigenous and a liberta aliena was not perceived uh, in, the same, in the same way. Uh, but we see that uh, this, uh, this was not uh, um, really the case um, in all, everywhere. Um, okay, um, looking at Manumission um, Matrimonium House, we know that. It represented one of the legal exceptions for uh, ignoring the age limits imposed by the law. So, uh, master and uh, slave could be actually younger than uh, uh, 20 and 30. Uh, on, the other on the other hand, Amunition uh, of Trimani Causa also had uh, some, uh, some limitations. For example, that uh, uh, one man, so um, the master could not, uh, sorry, one man at a time could be manumitri uh, matrimony causa. So the idea of a master that could free 10 or 20 slaves and then marry them is absolutely um, crazy. So just one woman at a time. It is true they could actually divorce her uh, and do, you know, repeat the process, but. Um, I mean, I don't know how many cases we have uh, of this. We also know that, for example, senators were, could not use so many so senators and, descendant, and their descendants could not uh, be married to a free woman, but they could have um, a free woman as, con uh, as a concubine. And then we have the other exception, which is the other limitation that the master could not be a union or sexually uh, important. Um, anyway, um, let's move on. So, uh, I'm not going to be um, too specific on data today. I don't want to bore you uh, too much. Um, I rather want to uh, show you some specific case and uh, discuss my interpretation. 
of, um, of the data we, uh, we have. So in total, I managed to collect uh, 1,900 partners. Uh, I use partners, sometimes I use husbands, but um, I actually included all the type of uh, relationships uh, we can have. So in many cases, they were uh, matrimonia justa, so of course they were uh, legally acknowledged. Uh, some other times, probably they were not, but we don't know. And we don't know because sometimes uh, people use specific terms like conux, uxor, or maritus, even if they were talking about people that could not have a legally valid uh, marriage, for example, a slave. Um, so I actually included all of them. The distinction, I'm not going to make a distinction between the different types of, uh, of unions. The presence of these marital terms, uh, plus the fact that sometimes we have uh, these funeral monuments with uh, uh, children and the children uh, refer to their parents as a mother and father, <coughs> plus uh, um, portraits, like uh, group portraits, um, are the base of my, of my um, investigation. So the data I collected is, are based on, uh, on this. So let's start. Oh, I, I know the difference between, so the data are, the, are split between Rome, Italy and the provinces. Uh, not just because it was much easier to work on the data, so I did this distinction not just for this topic but for all the topics, but also because I think it is very important to uh, consider that different areas had different communities and different environments. So we have to consider that what happened uh, you know, in Rome was not the situation you could find like in a military court in the German, um, German provinces or like uh, in, a, in a small uh, uh, town in, uh, in Italy. Anyway, let's start with, uh, with Rome. So uh, from Rome, I actually have collected 200, uh, I had 232 um, patron husbands, uh, so patrons married to their uh, three women. And uh, if you look at the legal status of, uh, uh, of this man, we see that we have a very, very big number of uh, incertis, so people whose legal status is not clear. Uh, many of them were free persons, but we know if they were either freeborn or freed. And even if they have just one cognomen, it doesn't mean that they were, um, that they were slaves because uh, many inscriptions that come from Rome come from Columbaria, which were, were very strong familiar context. So the people who actually visited this place knew the disease. So there was no, um, it was not necessary to write all, you know, or um, the CV or the ID of uh, the people buried there. Anyway, um, what we can say about the data is that um, a free woman out of three in Rome was married to her patron. Uh, that uh, looking at the patron's legal status, we have a very high number of incest, as I said, and then I have more freedmen than um, freeborn. We have a predominance of exogamic union, the unions where the husband is a freeborn, and uh, a, um, a predominance of endogamic unions where the husband is a freedman. Um, how do I interpret this, uh, uh, this data? Um, first, I mean, if we consider Rome, it is very likely that there were strong biases in the city from the elite. So, the actual elite influenced a lot the lower classes. Uh, the high number of charity here, of course, uh, um, could be a clue that some people didn't want to expose the, dis the difference of legal status. So, if either of the partner was uh, a freeborn person and the other was a freedman, maybe they didn't want to highlight the fact that there was uh, this difference. Plus, as I said, the fact that the manuscription can come from Columbaria so probably was not necessary to um, report all, uh, all the, the data about the person. Um, talking about the, so the people who actually uh, arranged these uh, funeral monuments, um, I would say that we can call these people in general, not just for Rome, also for Italy and the provinces, just that uh, we have different type of, um, of, of people, and I will explain that later. We can call, um, call them some kind of middle class. I know that is a very, very wrong term to use when we, um, when we talk about the ancient word, the Roman word, because 
course, is a modern term with uh, uh, different, uh, you know, completely different meaning. But we are talking about people <coughs> who actually were not the elite. Uh, but on the other hand, they were not people at the lowest levels of Roman society. The only fact that could actually have slaves and they could manipulate them, uh, the fact that they, they um, actually could uh, set up a monument, it is true that <coughs> those who actually were born in Columbaria was probably easier and less expensive, but we have many funerary monuments, they're not just inscriptions, they're very beautiful funerary monuments, uh, complex cars, so quite expensive. Uh, so we have to assume that these people were some kind uh, in the middle. You know, it's a very, very big group. It's very variegated and uh, actually, I think it needs a lot of work and study uh, for in, in the future. Um, another thing that we, we have can assume for uh, the Friedman here, for the free cultural aspects, is that uh, some of these freedmen actually were previously um, fellow freedmen of their wives. So let's think about uh, Trimalchio, just to uh, use like um, an example we all know. Uh, he was a slave, he had a relationship with another slave, he, uh, he got uh, manumitted and then he manumitted his, uh, his wife. So he became his, her patron, but before that he was her fellow, uh, fellow freedmen. Okay, I want to show you a few, a few examples. So, this one is uh, an inscription uh, from the 21st century. And most of the inscriptions I found, uh, and it's not just about this, it's in general, uh, come from the first uh, two centuries of the empire. Um, of course, we know that uh, from the second century, the use of uh, uh, terms like libertus, liberta tend to uh, disappear, so it's probably one of the reasons uh, why inscriptions <coughs> on uh, uh, free persons become um, more rare. Anyway, we have uh, um, the description of uh, Claudia Stepte, and uh, we know that uh, the, her monument, it's a funerary monument, was set up by a uh, patronus et contu bernalis. Uh, we can see here that uh, we have so we are talking about two free uh, people. So Claudia Stepte is a free woman, and uh, Tiberius Claudius uh, Nifodotus is an imperial freedman. Uh, so they could actually have been uh, legally married, but at times he used the term uh, come to Bernalis. Uh, probably it's a reminiscence from you know the, the, the language that they use as slaves. Uh, anyway, we have a typical example of uh, um, a fellow Friedman that becomes um, uh, becomes uh, uh, the the pattern. So here, of course, we have. Uh, I mean, mm, it's some kind of manumissio matrimonial causa. Even if we have to say that uh, it probably bought her first, so there was like a passage in uh, um, in between. Um, here, yeah, we are not talking well. Uh, we could have been a uh, freedman, we don't know, that's, you know, when we, when we talk about the big number of interests, the problem we have, we have an example. Uh, another inscription, um, Volusia Olympias and uh, uh, her partner, uh, Marcus Salicinius Eutipus. And uh, if we look at, if we just like base our uh, analysis <coughs> on, the, on the nominal, we would say that it's an exogam union. We don't, you know, she's Bulusia, is a Licinius, so what connection, we don't know what connection they had. But then we see that he explains more. He says that we dispensate the Lusus of Quartus, who worked as dispensator for the, uh, the family of, uh, of her uh, wife. Um, this is a very lucky case. In general, we don't have these uh, this lucky um, examples. We know, um, uh, on the other hand, that many relationships actually, uh, especially with families, started between people that work in the same environment. Um, for example, there is a, a couple of uh, imperial um, freedmen, and uh, they were both working for. So they were like carers of the emperor's children. So uh, different tasks, but same environment. So it's just like to give you an idea of you know how uh, actually exogamic unions could start. You know we have just small example. Of course the 
uh, actually, we can handle the situations uh, with that. also, of course, arranged marriages. Uh, but uh, of course, we're not um, always so uh, lucky. Um, last inscription from Rome is uh, uh, this is a very beautiful uh, monument. Uh, um, the girl portrait here is uh, Ilia Coppola. She uh, was freeborn. She died uh, very young at the age of eight. The monument was uh, set up by her father, Junius Ephesinus, and her mother. And uh, the picture we have of, uh, of, of this family, of course, is, is a very sad uh, situation, but we, we see like quite, you know, a lot of harmony, you know, parents were, of course, uh, desperate for uh, the loss of the girl, but there doesn't seem to be um, any problem with it, uh, between them. But if we turn the monument, we see that the situation is slightly different. And we can still get more information about the family. First is that uh, once, one thing that I didn't show you is that the mother's name is missing. It's not because the inscription is damaged, but because it's been erased. So it's some kind of Bambiato Memoria. And we know that this happened because she was a free woman, active, and she was uh, manumista gratis, so she was uh, manumitted for free. Uh, a case of uh, manumissio uh, matrimoni causa. Um, she had uh, uh, with at least one child, I mean, the one she, she died, we don't, we don't know anything else. Uh, but she, at some point in her life, she fell for another man, who by the way was married himself because he's described as uh, adulterous, and he, um, she uh, left her husband, but before doing that, she actually stole two slaves. So, what we have here is uh, a defixio, so it's a magical course. And uh, it was probably um, commissioned by the, the patron's heirs, who actually so you know, the, the slaves disappear. And uh, the, the patron actually died, heartbroken for, for, this, uh, uh, you know, for this situation. So uh, we know from the legal sources that uh, uh, the heirs actually had all the legal tools to get the slaves back. But the fact that he relied uh, on magic to punch her, you know, made such suppose that she ran away and they, they never actually managed to, to, to catch her. So um, I'm not, of course, going to uh, say anything about the morality of the situation, what happened. But what I want to show you is that uh, um, sometimes we have a very positive uh, picture of the Manumissum of Humanitago. So, you know, a woman actually had. Um, some kind of uh, easy way to, uh, to obtain an emission. But uh, it, of course, some, some, of course, some patrons, some masters were probably wonderful men and the marriage worked very, very well. Sometimes, of, some others, of course, were not very uh, so, you know, so positive. Uh, we know that uh, a master could not force a slave to, um, to the manumission of matrimony house. So, even like after an mission, so even if uh, a master had uh, um, received the promise from the slave of marrying uh, him after an mission, he could not force her after that. But he could actually, if she refused after that, she could have brought her back to slavery. So it was not such a free situation for a woman. She was uh, caught between the choice of a permanent slavery and enslavement. So being just a slave in the house, in the household, or becoming the mother familias, of course. Okay, let's move to the next area, which is um, Italy. Um, for Italy, you have 140 patron husbands, which represent uh, less than 20%. So less than a few women out of five actually was married to her patron. Uh, if we look at uh, the patron's um, uh, legal status, we see that we have a lower number of incerti, of course, different, so different society here, uh, smaller communities, uh, and uh, probably there wasn't the same level of shame, um, you know, uh, connected to the legal status that we have, we have in Rome. 
and uh, um, we liberty and in general have similar values, which means that uh, uh, a free woman, so if we exclude, of course, in China, which is still of uh, um, of uh, fifty percent, uh, a woman actually was either uh, had the possibility to marry either an indigenous or a libertus. <coughs> And um, we have a predominance of exogamic unions when the husband is freeborn. And uh, well, exogamic and exogamic unions have very similar values when the husband is a free uh, is a free person. Uh, so my interpretation here uh, is that we have few uh, fewer social biases compared to Rome. Uh, still, we have in general and Dali uh, as members of the middle class, but completely different from the one over. We don't have, you know, freedmen or slaves of the very big gender. So we, we have some, but they're not so uh, so many. Uh, people here are, you know, the middle class are local politicians, uh, members of uh, religious college. Uh, we have veterans, um, soldiers, let's say, and we have traders. So people who actually run businesses and uh, had uh, uh, trades. And um, so the gentles here are more reduced in size, and uh, we also have to consider the importance of affinities here. Um, to try to explain this is very, very well. Affinities, you know, is uh, the connection that a family can, a family, uh, a family yeah, can create with another family, and marriage was a perfect tool to do this. Of course, if we have, just to make an example, uh, like more modern, if we think about, uh, you know, 19th century when we have members of the Borgesi, so they were very wealthy, they had uh, um, very important, you know, they were very important um, socially speaking, but they did not have a title. On the other hand, we had like very, like, um, heirs of noble families, but they were like broken. So this you know, marriage between uh, people of this two situation was of course a win-win situation. We have to assume that something like that could have happened in uh, um, Italian cities, and uh, like families of uh, like a freeborn man could actually have chosen to marry Alberta Nina. It is true she was a free woman, so we could see it, it as a marrying down. But on the other hand, if she belonged to a good family, so the a wealthy one or the one with the right connection, was of course a good. Uh, um, a uh, good opportunity for for the man to have like an improvement of, uh, of like in his political career, so to have like a push uh, in his, or also of course for traders, you know, businesses that have like similar interests could actually um, be joined together. Okay, and uh, just to to give you a couple of examples of this, so the importance of the right wife. Um, I want to show you these uh, uh, the descriptions, the monument from Sepinum, and where we have uh, uh, two men, they are father and son. They are both uh, freeborn, so they're both in January. We know that the son was a quatorvir, so um, you know, um, a local politician, and they were both married to two liberte aliene, uh, from two different familias. Uh, what I actually uh, want to highlight here is that if it had been such a shame for the father to marry Alberta Liena, the son would have never done the same mistake, especially if you want to, you know, improve your uh, your position uh, politically and socially speaking. And uh, a similar situation, unfortunately, I don't have a photo. If any of you get the description, no, I will take some time to see to have to get a photo of the monument. Uh, it's from Las Pompeia, and same situation, uh, two uh, <coughs> freeborn father and son, married to Liberta Liene, and the father was a Shakespeare, uh, the son was a Shakespeare and a Cotorvio. I don't know if we can interpret it as an improvement, because maybe the father had more um, you know, um, offices uh, that actually were important on the tax for a diet, you know, before um, getting others. But we see the same situation, you know, to in general marriage to uh, invest the Alina, and this was not prejudicial to their, um, you know, political career and uh, their place in society. Um, 
Um, talking about uh, traders, I want to show you uh, this um, this text uh, from Augusto Carinoro, and uh, it's a quite interesting text. Not just because you know for my topic today, but also because uh, we have uh, a very um, rare profession, which is the profession of the clavarius. It's uh, very rare for men. It's uh, is a unicorn for a woman, and uh, a clavarius is for what we know it because we're not 100 sure, and our scholars are not so so sure. It's uh, um, a traders in uh, iron nails. We know that uh, um, the area of uh, so the the the, the Transpadana was actually um, a very important area for the production of iron, and it was of course at the entrance of the Gauls. So it's a very strategic position and uh, having this kind of uh, um, business uh, for the, you know, for the army was actually, I mean, to, to sell, of course, the products of the army was, uh, was a very uh, good thing. So here we have a monument that actually was set up by a free woman when she was still alive, uh, Cornelia Venusta. She, is described, she describes herself as a Clavaria. And uh, uh, her husband, uh, Publius Ebusius, who was uh, a Clavarius himself, and he was an Augustalis, uh, he, was, she, he was her partner. Then there's like a free woman uh, and um, a dedicata, either or a, a child, uh, or so th their daughter, or just like uh, a slave girl, we, uh, we don't know. Anyway, if we look at the photo and we see, so the, the woman's name is slightly bigger. Uh, and uh, she is the one who actually arranged the monument. So she is the one who chooses the text and she how to dispose, uh, uh, to display everything. Um, what we, I mean, scholars are uh, inclined to think is that either the business belonged to the woman or the business was shared, but the, responsi uh, the responsibility was shared like 50% each um, woman as the different woman and her partner. <coughs> so we cannot exclude that actually the different woman inherited, not inherited, but she uh, kept working in the same uh, in the business that she that her, her partner had once the partner died. Uh, the um, the business was. Uh, Inherit by the different woman, rather probably by her husband, but she had, of course, a very important role in the business and, of course, in the city. We can see she has no shame in uh, describing her um, legal status, the fact that she's a free woman, while her husband or partner is uh, is a freeborn. So we can see here quite, you know, a lot of independence and enterprise. Uh, um, for this, for this one. Um, last um, area uh, comes to so the provinces. For the provinces, uh, the number of patronats is much smaller, just 87, and still, of course, 50% of uh, in charity. So here, three women have to fix married to her partner. We have the highest number. So if you look at the Minister Matrimony Council, we have the, the highest value um, in the provinces. Um, for the patron's legal status, we see a smaller number of charity, but still, in general, uh, are almost three times as uh, numerous as the liberty. We, uh, we have a slight uh, predominance of endodermic unions where the husband is freeborn, and the predominance of endodermic unions where the husband is a free man. So we can say that here, like uh, um, a marriage uh, for a woman who was very, you know, in familia. So, um, something that happened in the family. Uh, my interpretation is, of course, we have a smaller sample, so we cannot um, say much about, uh, so we have to look at the single cases, and especially consider only some, only few provinces are represented. Uh, here we also have the image situation where like, uh, so I'm talking about soldiers and their female slaves. So, so far we are talk we're talking about communities where I don't think we can say that there was 50% of men and 50% of women, of course we cannot say that. Uh, and we know that, for example, Augustus promoted uh, a marriage between freeborn and uh, free women, which means that at some point there weren't enough women, but we, there, were, there wasn't the lack of women that you could find in a military fort. 
So uh, it is true that, of course, military force then turned into uh, tiles and they had access also to, you know, local women. But uh, we had to also think that many soldiers, for many soldiers, especially those of, you know, lower ranks, the only chance they had to, uh, to have, like, actually a wife, even if technically they were not allowed um, until, I think, like, the mid-third uh, century, uh, so it was to either buy a slave and then uh, marry meet her and marry her after they became better or just, you know, have uh, a relationship when uh, uh, he was still um, a soldier. Uh, or, if he was lucky, to receive a female slave uh, as part of the booty. And that was, of course, a very lucky situation because according to uh, some researches, uh, for like for a soldier to uh, he had to work for one year and a half so save all the, 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 the money actually all the salary he got from the army uh, in order to buy a slave so you know it's not uh, an easy an easy uh, expense it was of course quite an important one and probably fetus here is not you know as important as we, we can expect from you know uh, Italian cities. Even if we have to assume that for regions like, uh, you know, those in the Iberian Peninsula, the situation was likely more similar to those in, uh, uh, in Italy because they, become, they became Roman much uh, long before, uh, like the Germanic, uh, uh, the Germanic areas, for example. So, talking about like soldiers um, here, I uh, have an example from Carmelito. So, we have this man who actually was uh, originally from, from northeast of Italy, from Verona, and uh, is right here. And um, it's, um, we know that he was uh, married to his freed woman, uh, Acte. Uh, we don't know whether they started to be, of course, a couple before he became a veteran, because he's a veteran, so we know that he was allowed uh, to have a legally valid marriage and to have a knowledge children. Uh, or if you know everything started long before that, and it just you know used the the typical uh, language that they used uh, for uh, like a funeral monument. Uh, another one from Ludum. Here it's very likely that this, the, the relationship started long before it became better, because uh, we know that they have been uh, so. The, we have a free woman, very young Genoa and uh, she um, lived with her uh, patron husband for 22 years. So it's quite, you know, a long, um, quite a long time. And they also have two daughters, Verkundina, uh, Verina uh, and Vera. And uh, so, of course, it is very likely that uh, uh, the relationship started long before uh, the, before the, 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 this, this man became a, a veteran. And uh, still, you know, we, what, we, what we have here is a portrait of, you know, uh, a normal family, so husband, uh, uh, wife, and she's described as a liberta upon them at college, so she was she used to be a free woman, and now uh, she's uh, her, um, her spouse. And then, last, last descriptions I want to show you, the last example is the one of Acinia Picusa. I think that some of you know her well. She was a very uh, important woman. She actually was a very important person uh, in a town which was uh, Sigilia Barba in uh, in Bantica. Um, she lived in the second century. Um, she lived in the second century um, AD, and uh, what you see here is a funerary monument, uh, the one she uh, set up for herself. As slaves and a freeman. So the husband was not there, the children were not there, neither the grandchildren. So just for herself and uh, as slaves and freeman. Just this is, you know, a very strong uh, sign of independence. So I just want to, you know, uh, I, I have my own funerary uh, monument. So um, what we know about Shibikusa is that she was uh, a free woman, she married her uh, patron who was a minor Sarchidius uh, Fronto. Uh, we don't know much about him because we know that he was Prefectus Fabrum, so he didn't reach you know, the highest uh, 
um, offices of local politics was, you know, quite um, not important. We know that the Achilia family was uh, very wealthy, and uh, uh, we know that she was uh, very important for for the town because her um, <coughs> children and her grandchildren, so long after she died, uh, when she when they um, set up monuments for themselves. They describe themselves as children and grandchildren of Achille Bribusa rather than of Achilles. So she had, she was the one, you know, the fam the one who was actually famous, the important one of uh, of the family. And today I want to show you uh, two inscriptions, two monuments she she set up uh, for uh, um, a friend of her and uh, his wife. Uh, so is Publio, is Magnus, Magnus, Rufus, Magonianus. We have only CD actually, was a procurator of the And it was like, it was an important member of, uh, you know, an important person of that time. And uh, Achille Bricusa describes him as Amicus Optimus, so great friend. Uh, we have to suppose that this was, uh, you know, the monument and there was a statue of uh, of Magonius, but the statue is, is gone. And uh, a similar situation we see in this uh, other monument. Uh, the, 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 the subject, the object of the monument is uh, Carvilla Censonilla, who was the wife of uh, Magnus Rufus, again, <coughs> uh, who is a city. And uh, again, she, the woman is described as Anita Optima, so a very dear, a dear friend. What we can see here is that it seems that it was Achille Pecusa who actually had the right connections, or actually she made the right connections. So if we know that she comes from the same family, the same family of Achille, so she was a slave, but we have to assume that she had the right personality, the right character, the right enterprise to make the right connections, to be, you know, um, to actually make the family count within the community in which in which they um, they live. Uh, so here we have a, an example of Magnusium Athenonica, which is completely different from the one we saw from Rome. So why the first one we see that you know we cannot say that you know Acta was uh, um, treated bad by her husband and we should just find out another man. But at some point you know the harmony just uh, broke down. Here is that we have a completely different situation. It is true that we have a Magnesium Matrimony Causa, but the marriage seems not just to work, but also to, you know, uh, allow a freeborn man, so uh, Achilles, to shine thanks to uh, his, his wife, who was actually just, you know, a nice lady. So something to, we have, and she was a woman, of course. So it's another thing to consider for the Roman times. Okay, to, to conclude, um, so, uh, what I wanted to do here today, it wasn't to actually deny the importance of the Magnesium Matrimony Causa, of course. Uh, a woman had that choice, a master had that choice. We also have to consider that um, a marriage in Roman time was not an individual thing. It's not something that a person could choose so easily, because even if we think about freeborn women and freeborn men, the family had a very strong influence, you know, a very strong impact. We know of, you know, for example, um, um, Cicero's uh, daughter Tuliola, that actually she, she married someone that her, her mother wanted. So, and, you know, so the last, the last husband she had. So, of course, it was an arranged marriage. If it was like that for men and women of the elite, we have to assume that you know the same situation was. Uh, uh, we can find the same situation for the you know lower classes and especially for ex slaves. Uh, the pattern had a very strong uh, impact on the choice of the free woman's uh, partner. Actually, he could. Uh, um, actually, she could not have a legally valid marriage if the pattern was not. Uh, but not giving his consent. So we also have, of course, to consider that many fit women managed to obtain an admission very young. 
So we're talking about uh, little girls, two, three, four, I mean half girls that died at the age of one and they were uh, they are called the inventors, so uh, they were really free. So uh, the family, so not just the party, but also the family uh, must have had, of course, a very strong influence. Um, not, of course, we don't consider this, but also that the environment had a very strong impact. If you live in a big family, you have a very wide pool you can draw on, of course, and the same your family for, your, for yourself. Uh, on the other hand, in smaller families, because we tend to think, when we think about, you know, slaves, we, we tend to think about the big tenders with hundreds and thousands of slaves. But the majority of Roman families, if they were lucky, have what, one, two slaves? Uh, so even in that case, for example, the, the slave was a man. And Mr. Matimoni cut was actually impossible. So, um, so the environment, of course, was very important. The environment, considering the familia, also considering the community, the society in which the, uh, the people live. Uh, so, yeah, so I'm not denying the importance of Mr. Matimoni cut. I'm just saying that women had uh, uh, different, could make different choices. Some of these women were actually trained. So they were educated people, they had a profession, uh, so they could, you know, uh, rely on that. And uh, of course they could, you know, count on uh, family relations um, as well. So not just, you know, trying to uh, seduce the husband, the, the partner, the master, but also, you know, to rely on other slaves, so that you can free them. Uh, so, so just to say that, you know, but we, but we saw the castle was a possibility, it was not the only one. Uh, it was not the only one for, the, for the, 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 the slave woman, but also for the master, of course. You saw that, you know, a, a, a pastor could actually have chosen to um, make her, uh, his, uh, one of his three women, marry a man from another family because it was, you know, a good, uh, you know, a good uh, connection. Uh, especially, you know, in, uh, in smaller towns. Okay, that's that's it. Um, I hope it was. I wasn't. I didn't bore you too much. I try not to uh, be too technical and just to look at the data too much. You know that they are quite boring, and uh, you know the, the topic is already quite uh, heavy. So um, I'm free to. I mean, I'm happy to answer to all uh, your questions. Thank you.